But we're going to a prequel. Not a sequel. We're going back to the prequel. You know, they, sometimes they do a prequel. So this is where Holy Spirit has us tonight. Go with me to Revelation 2. We're going to jump off here. Revelation 2. Verse 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her, get this now, those that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds. This is so important. The minds and the hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. The message that the Lord would share with you tonight entitled. And he specifically told me, he said, the title of your message is in Revelation 2. I gave her time. This is a very important prophetic announcement tonight unto the church and specifically under the leadership of the church. But this will also be in preparation for you to understand how you will move in this harvest going forward. Title of the message, I gave her time. Father, we have come now in your name, Jesus. He said, if we come together, that you would be in the midst. We have gathered together now in your name, Lord. We have come alone in you. Now you be the teacher. You be the instructor, the guide. You be the redeemer, the healer. You be the strengthener tonight. You be the one that would refresh those who are now being ready for this great harvest. We pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Go back with me to John 4. You know the last two services that we have been talking about this woman at the well. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, He told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see Him, they begged Him to stay in their village. You see, we've established over the last two services in teaching that the religious and the cultural identity, the religious and cultural identity of the people of Samaria was not working for them. The woman that had five husbands, the woman that she, the one that she was with now was not her husband. Her life was a wreck. Her life was a mess. But yet she was very, very intelligent, very schooled on her religion, was she not? She said, Jew, what are you doing talking to me? The Jews say we should worship in Jerusalem. My, our ancestors say we should worship here in Mount Gerizim. What? How are you going to get living water? You don't have a bucket and a rope. The Holy Spirit revealed to us that this was the identity of religion and culture that had so bound this woman. She had all of those things, but what she needed was Jesus and the living water that only He could give. Amen. All right? So he stayed for two days. It wasn't just her in the village. There were so many in captivity. Because upon her testimony, they streamed from the village. They streamed from the city within the region of Samaria. It wasn't just her. There were so, so many in captivity. No doubt in captivity of the same religious mindset and cultural value. So it says that they came out. And how do we know that their lives were more than likely in the same condition? Even though individually the scripture only speaks of this woman's condition. But many came out. And what did they do? They begged him to stay. They have now tasted and seen of something that was changing their very existence. They begged him to stay. 
And they said to the woman, Now we believe not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. Now, Holy Spirit, we're going on a big journey tonight. And I'll try to go quick and not bog you down, but we've got to teach and get some history. Holy Spirit says this question here in John 4. How did we get here? How did this people get in such a messed up state? How? How did this people get in such a situation that their lives were so wrecked that a Jew, nonetheless, that they knew they were not to have any dealings with, nor the Jews would have any dealings with them. That they were now begging this Jew to stay in their village. How did they get there? Holy Spirit takes us back now to 1 Kings 12. Let's go back. So the king paid no attention to the people. This turn of events was the will of the Lord, for it has fulfilled the Lord's message to Jeroboam, son of Nebat, through the prophet Ahijah from Shiloh. When all Israel realized that the king had refused to listen to them, they responded, Down with the dynasty of David, we have no interest in the son of Jesse. Back to your homes, O Israel, look out for your own house, O David. So the people of Israel returned home, but Rehoboam continued to rule over the Israelites who lived in the towns of Judah. Rehoboam is the successor of Solomon, Solomon's son. Amen? He comes in this moment where the kingdom is now being handed over to the successor of Solomon. We have the son of Rehoboam, but we also have an individual by the name of Jeroboam. Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, Jeroboam was who? Jeroboam was a superintendent, if you will, over the public projects that Solomon had instituted in the land. Jeroboam was not in the palace. He was actually out among the people. Jeroboam heard the cries of the people. Solomon had so much going on and so much taxation and so, so much cruelty that had been handed down to the people, if you will, and, 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 and really enslaving them, if you will, to complete these projects that they cried out. And who was there to hear their cries? Jeroboam. Jeroboam was a superintendent of these projects and he was very high up in the land. So he understood the problems that were happening in Israel. Rehoboam has an opportunity to, to be the successor and the king over the nation who is Solomon's son. So now we have this moment. Jeroboam's out doing his thing one day and the prophet Ahijah stops him in the field and gives him a garment. He says, now rip the garment, I believe the word of the Lord says, into ten pieces. So then he rips the garment into ten pieces and Ahijah the prophet looks at Jeroboam. Okay, just getting some backstory. Looks at Jeroboam and said, this is representative of the ten tribes that the Lord is going to hand over to your rule. He's taking them from the house of Solomon. So when this gets wind around, they about ready to kill Jeroboam. So Jeroboam goes off to Egypt. He flees. But now it comes to the time that Rehoboam is to take succession after Solomon and take the kingdom. And then Jeroboam comes back. Rehoboam goes to his advisors and says, what should I do? The old, I believe it's the Bible. And I'm trying to get all the history right. The Bible says that the old advisor said, man, you need to let up on the people. But the young advisor said, do more than your daddy did. Rehoboam, Rehoboam followed the, the, the wisdom of, of bad wisdom, if you will, of the young advisors and says, you think my daddy was hard on you. You ain't seen nothing yet. I'm just paraphrasing. Right? So this is where we're at in this moment, right? Down with the dynasty of David, man. We don't, we, no, forget it. Fend for yourself. Good luck to you, house of David. So then we have this great split in the nation of Israel. You have the kingdoms of the north called Israel. We have the, 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 the tribes in the south called Judah. And we have this great split. And now we have Jeroboam leading in the north and Rehoboam in the south. Right? So we got the split. Everybody good? And that's how we got there. Everybody good? You win. It's important to understand. Because you're going to see a moving down the line 
that, call, that, that, that caused these people in the region of Samaria to be in the captivity that they're in. Look. Let's go now to 1 Kings 12 at verse 25. Jeroboam then built up the city of Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, and it became his capital. You know, the nation is now split. Later he went and built up the town of Peniel, Peniel and Jer Jeroboam thought to himself, this is the problem. This is what, this is what has messed up the church that we speak of even this hour. This, man, this is, this is just crazy right here. It says, Jerob, this is where you will mess up. Jeroboam thought to himself, you better make sure you're hearing from the Lord. This is where he messed up. It says Jeroboam thought he had been, it had been prophesied over him that these tribes would come to him and there would be a split. You know, I don't know what the Lord would have done if Jeroboam would have lent his ear to the ways of Yahweh. I don't know. We only know what happened. What happened is Jeroboam thought to himself. This is like the biggest thing. Like, like man... If you don't know how to move, don't move. <laughs> you better wait on the Lord. I'm not going up unless you go before me, God. Amen. Amen. My daddy, when I left 18 years old in the driveway to go to college, he said, boy, if you got a question in your heart, don't do it. <laughs> Amen. Because he knew the Holy Spirit would be my guider. And if he was questioning something, you better. Right? Here's the problem. Jeroboam thought to himself, unless I am careful, the kingdom will return to the dynasty of David. When these people go to Jerusalem, see, where was the proper place of worship? Jerusalem. Wasn't up there. Where was the proper place to offer sacrifice? Where were the festivals to take place? Where were, come on. Yep. Wasn't there. Unless I am careful, the kingdom will return to the dynasty of David. David, when these people go to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord, they will give their allegiance to King Rehoboam of Judah. They will kill me and make him their king instead. Jeroboam got worried about himself, didn't he? He thought to himself. So in the advice of his counselors, the king made two calves. He said to the people, it is too he's making it convenient for the people. It is too much trouble for you to worship in Jerusalem. Look, Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of Egypt. And that's a mistake, mistake, mistake. Remember when the golden calf was first built? <laughs> Moses comes down and says, what in the world? See, this statement's been made before, hasn't it? This is who brought you out of Egypt. Here he is, he's saying again, these are the gods who brought you out of Egypt. He placed these gold, these calf idols in Bethel and in Dan at either end of the kingdom. But this became a great sin for the people. They worship the idols traveling as far north as Dan to worship one there. What you need to go back and understand here is some, it's not really confirmed because it's back and forth, but some scholars would believe, it says in verse 25, that the city of Shechem is actually Sukkar, Sychar, ever how you want to pronounce it. I mean, pronounce pronunciation, I know it's S-Y-C-H-R. What is Sychar? What is Sukkar? What is that? It's the village, it's the town of the woman at the well. Some would believe that Shechem and Sychar are exactly the same city in the region that we would become known of biblical history of Samaria. Alright? So this is where all this stuff began to happen. This is where all this captivity began to, began to roll up and become this great storm to where this woman finds her life with five different husbands and the one that's with her now in her husband. This comes from this moment. Come on. What happens? Man's hand gets involved. Jeroboam thought to himself. Alright? Jeroboam instituted a religious festival in Bethel held on the 15th day of the 8th month in, in imitation. You look at that. It says the festival, it's an imitation of the annual festival of, of shelters. An imitation. See, this is what, the when man gets involved, Mark, this is what he'll try to do. He'll try to imitate the genuine and authentic. Oh, I can't wait till the authentic blows the doors off of everything and nobody else looks at the thing anymore that man's hand can perform. Can somebody get it? Amen. Amen. Come on. He tried to imitate. See, this is where man's hand gets involved. And this is where the people under man's leadership find themselves in a place called captivity. Let's look on a little bit further. 
It gets worse. I'm sorry to tell you. <laughs> Come on. We learned it tonight. First Kings 16. We still in the northern kingdom. Verse 23. Omri began to rule over Israel in the 31st year of King Asa's reign in Judah. Kingdom split. Omri's in Israel. Who is Omri following here? Later on down the line, who's Omri following? Jeroboam. All right. He reigned 12 years in all, six of them in Tisra. Then Omri bought the hill now known as what? Samaria. Well, we can't get away from the region and the woman at the well. Samaria. From its owner, Shema, for 150 pounds of silver. He built a city on it and called the city Samaria in honor of Shema. But Omri did, Omri did what was evil in the Lord's sight. Even more than any of the kings before him. For he did what? He followed the example of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, in all the sins he had committed and led Israel to commit. The people provoked the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, with their worthless idols. So as we see a continuation of man's hand involved. It's what you was talking about tonight. Man's hand involved in garbage that don't have anything to do with the word puts women in and puts men in captivity. You understand? He thought to himself, and Jeroboam did what? He, your flesh will never get it right. Your flesh is at war with the spirit. Amen? Come on. Man, if your spirit man, somebody says, how do I know what to do? If your spirit man has taken full control of your soul and your body, and you're with the Lord day in and day out in the sweet hour of prayer, and you know his voice and he knows your voice, then you can go with your gut. Come on, somebody. I tell people that. It's all right. But if I know that their life is not where it needs to be, and they're not in the secret place with the Lord, and they don't know His voice, come on. Then you better not go with your gut. Why? Because your gut will lead you wrong 100% of the time. Amen. 100% of the time. People get so sick, they want me to give them some sort of magical answer to their situation and to their problem. And I say this a hundred times over and over again. You need to get in the secret place and learn the voice of God. Amen. Amen. Amen? Come on. I don't have a magical solution to everything that's going on in your life. But I'm going to tell you there's one that knows the very number of hair upon your head. And when you get in line with him and get in touch with him and he knows your voice and you know his voice, baby, he will solve everything going forward. Amen. In a way, you tell me just to read my Bible and stay in the secret place. Honey, that's the answer. Period. Don't add anything to it. Don't take any away from it. Amen. That's the answer. I'm preaching now. i got to get back to teaching. Here we go. Man's way continued here with Omrah. And the Bible says that he continued in the sins of Jeroboam. Does anybody know who Omrah is a daddy to? About to get ugly now. That's why it was so nasty, man. <laughs> Anybody remember? Let's go on. First Kings 16, continue at 29. Ahab, the son of Omri, began to rule over Israel in, 38, in, in the 38th year of King Asa's reign in Judah. He reigned in Samaria 22 years. But Ahab, son of Omri, did what was evil in the Lord's sight. Even more than any kings before him. And he and and as excuse me and as thought it were not enough to follow the sinful example of Jeroboam, he didn't just follow. He married Jezebel. He married Jezebel, the very spirit that the Lord calls out in Revelation two. The very spirit, Miss Pam, that in Revelation two in our opening passage of Scripture, it's the very spirit of Jezebel that will lead the people into great tribulation. When the leadership of the church gets into the bed with Jezebel and begins to lead people to commit adultery upon their God in the spirit of Jezebel, you know what comes? What did it say in Revelation two at the church of Thyatira? Great tribulation. Amen? Man, there's some stuff about to get uncovered in this moment that's going to blow you away. 
What happens here? Ahab comes on the scene. He gets Jezebel going. And she's ready to annihilate the prophets of God who are the communicators of the word of God. Amen. Amen. These are the ones that would give word in the earth of God's plan, of God's mysteries, of God's ways. And she comes now and she, my God in heaven. That's why right now in the pulpits of America, you are seeing some churches not even take text from the word of God. They are taking a good thought for the day. You know what's creeped up in there? Such an alliance with the world, which is representative of the spirit of Jezebel. And what does the spirit of Jezebel do? It silences the word of God. It silences the word of God. So here is where we're standing. We see Ahab come. He gets in bed with Jezebel. He built a temple and an altar for Baal in Samaria. You see, see how bad it gets. First of all, we've got Jeroboam building up calves and things that are representative of Yahweh, right? These are the ones that brought you out of, of Egypt. <clears throat> It's totally wrong. Don't get what I'm saying. I'm not saying it's not as bad. It's totally wrong. But at least maybe there was still a connection that, 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 that represented Yahweh or something. You know what I'm saying? But now there is altar and temples of a totally different entity being built in the promised land. Man, this is getting off way off, man. And so we have these ways of man. Man's way fully manifested will completely deny the word of God. Holding to men's traditions, making the word of God what? Not effect. Now let's go back to John 4. That's your history lesson. It's over. But we're about to get into something crazy that we need to be in prayer about. And we need to hear from the Lord. John 4, 17. I don't have a husband, a woman, or a plot. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands. You see, the nation, the northern kingdom of Israel, who was it taken over by? Assyria? Right? Assyria? And then Assyria put people in the, in the northern kingdom, and they began to come together in marriage and produce people with the nation of Israel. And they become known as, the, the Jews would call them half-breeds, man. They would, be, they would, they would, show, they would, that's what they became known as. Had no dealings with them. This woman is one of these people. She's standing at the very moment of the place that would be identified as Shechem, Sychar, region of Samaria. All of these things started when Jeroboam thought to himself. All of these things that we find in captivity in the church now begin to happen when men started thinking to themselves. And roughly 900 years later, we have a region of Samaria that a people are so dry and so wrapped up in religion and captivity and culture that they come streaming to a Jew and say, would you please stay? Now you know how they, 900 years later, man's way holds a woman captive. She's a wreck. There's something fixing to happen in the church that you need to be aware of. What happens when man's way and men think to themselves? When men think to themselves and say culture, I'm not even just saying religion, but I'm saying culture too. Because I'm tired of being backed in a corner and say I've got to bow and give an allegiance to culture. Sorry, I'm a kingdom man. If you don't like it, that's okay. Come on somebody, get that. I'm not a right, I'm not a left, I'm a kingdom man. Amen. Quit trying to back me in a corner and give me some sort of identity and say conservatism is synonymous with the kingdom. I'm sorry, there's nothing synonymous with the kingdom. The kingdom stands alone forever and always. Amen. Come on. Well, I'm this because, of, come on. Mm. So it wasn't just... You see, this woman's captivity was wrapped up in religion because she said, you say we worship here, we're supposed to worship here. Are you greater than our ancestors? All of this stuff, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. But man, she's wrapped up in culture too. You know? You can't even talk to me, man. 
She's wrapped up in so much. She's so captive, man. Man, I just feel like this woman barely could carry her jar, man, to the well. She's so much in captivity. This is what happens when men think to themselves. Man's way holds a woman captive nearly 900 years later. Why? Because of the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. God's fixing to hold leadership in the church accountable like you've never seen before. Amen. There's a short window of repentance for leadership in the church. And if they do not hear the voice of God in this moment, the rug is fixed to be pulled out from under them. I know this is not popular that I would announce this in this call on a Wednesday night to a people. And you say, what does this have to do with me? I'm not in the pulpit. It has a lot to do with you. Look, God is ready in you. What does Jesus do? Mark 7, 9 and 13. He said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God. Talking to the leadership of the day. All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. We went over this. 13, verse 13 says, When you do this, this is what happens in verse 13. You make the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. He said, man, there's so many traditions and cultural things that you're holding to over and above the word of God. You do it in not just one area, but so many. He said, you make the word of God of no effect. You see, when man's hand, man's way, man's thinking, that's when God took me to Brownsville last fall. He said, I'm going to send my glory again to do the needed repairs to this church, this bride. And he's talking about the bride worldwide. He's going to get her right and get her ready for that great wedding ceremony. Amen. And he said, I'm going to do it again. In your generation, I'm going to do it. And he said this. This was the very thing that the Lord spoke to me and leveled me with in that house. He said, do not touch my glory. Don't you put your hand to it. Don't you put your, don't you think to yourself, Jamie. Come on. Look at continuation in Mark. He said, the problem is that you're holding this above the word of God. Men are not following the word of God anymore. They're following what they think. That's why you've got franchise church models that are following Chick-fil-A business model versus the New Testament. Men are thinking to themselves. Okay? It's become a business. Help us, Lord. Mark 7. What did he say on the backside of this? Men thinking to themselves, holding their own traditions. Verse 14. When he had called all the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand. There is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him. Those are the things that defile of man. If anyone hears, has ears to hear, let him hear. It's what comes out of him that defiles him. It's what's going on in the secret. In secret. Look a little bit further. We're going somewhere. We'll get moving. Look at the biblical model of secret. You're going to have to get this and understand this because we're fixing to go to Ezekiel 8 in a very serious moment. What's the biblical model of secret? No one lights a lamp and then covers it with a bowl or hides it under a bed. A lamp is placed on a stand where its light can be seen by all who enter the house. For all that is secret. Look now. For all that is, what's the biblical model of secret? For all that is secret will eventually be brought into the open. You may look at me as a pastor and say, man, he does pretty good. He doesn't seem like he has that much of a battle going on, all this stuff. You ain't seen my secret. You haven't seen my secret. Man, there's a war that rages 24 hours a day, seven days a week as the enemy comes in the secret. Yep. Sometimes, Shelly, I feel like I'm losing my mind. You ever been there? I remember standing in my driveway one day. I began to stand there and I felt like I was losing it. I said, God, 
Don't let him come at me today. Miss Pam, the peace of God came over me. And it's like I went to a different world, man. He knows if he can get me to operate in darkness in the secret place. See, the enemy knows the biblical model. You don't think he can read God's word? He knows that what is done in secret will eventually come into the open. And if there's ministry leadership that's doing things dark in the secret, that eventually it will come to the open and it will hurt the church. For all that is secret will eventually be brought into the open and everything that is concealed will be brought to light and made known to all. I know they think I'm crazy on those security cameras, KG, in that back room. I know they do. Because sometimes I speak in tongues going around that loop, getting the devil off my back, getting him out of my atmosphere, getting him out of my mind. I'm going to tell you this right now, man. I battle like you ain't never seen before. You don't realize. And I'm not just, I'm just telling you. But I'm going to tell you one thing, man. It's still at the name of Jesus that every demon will flee and everything has to run. My God, I'll speak the name of Jesus a thousand times a day, man. You've got to. Because it's not that what comes into a man, it's what comes out of a man that defiles a man. It's in the secret. For all that is secret will eventually be brought to the open. And everything is concealed will be brought to light and made known to all. You don't believe the biblical model? Go to 2 Samuel 12. What happens in the secret? Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered your right the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites. That's crazy all in itself. That's another story. Ammon is representative perversion. And that's exactly what David got hooked up in. Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites and stolen his wife. From this time on, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. Can I just give you something personal? The Holy Spirit's putting in my heart. All the way to work last night. He's burning in my heart, man. These three words. Let her be. I have such a burning in my heart for women. Man, and I believe God's going to burst something through this call to educate young women. God's beginning to burn something in my heart and educate young men. You know what He means by that? Let her be a child. Let her be a daughter. Let her be a wife. Let her be whatever I've called her to be. You know what the problem is? Men ain't got no business coveting another man's wife. Amen. Amen. If we can get enough young men educated of the Word of God in that fashion, when they look upon a woman and the enemy tries to tempt them with lust in their heart after another man's wife, I pray that it comes to their heart one day. Let her be somebody else's wife. That's not yours. Amen. Amen. My God, I feel such a burning for women. I do. That's somebody's daughter, man. That's somebody's child. That's not your next rape victim. That's some... My Amen. God in heaven. Amen. Women need to understand, young girls need to understand, my God, that they are created in the image of God and they don't have to put themselves even in a situation to get raped. Can somebody say amen? amen. They need to understand it. Just a burning in my heart, man. Let her be. It's time that a generation, my God, get that man. If somebody needs to hear that in this place tonight, you're struggling in that area. Listen, that's somebody's child. That's somebody's daughter. That's another man's wife. That ain't my God. Amen. Let her be. Come on, somebody. Mm. Maybe somebody needs to hear that tonight. I told Samantha that in the kitchen. I said, I said, man, God, God's want to raise up godly women again. So mother a nation ready for a harvest. She said, honey, you're going to be surprised one day when God brings all of this to pass. Amen. She said, it's going to be awesome. Amen. Ah, let's get back to this. What's the biblical model of secret? This is what the Lord says. Because what you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. 
I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes, and he will go to bed with them in public view. What's the biblical model of secret? You did it secretly, but I will make this happen to you openly. You see, there's leadership in the church right now that feel like they're okay in that dark room, in that secret, keeping a people in captivity. But he's fixing to bring so much to the open. I want you to read with me Ezekiel 8. We'll move quickly and finish. The entirety of Ezekiel 8 is so important right now. And this is just, Mark, this is where I told you, man, I said it's getting weird. I pulled the New Living Translation here in Ezekiel 8. And it says this, verse 1. Then on September 17th. <laughs> what's tomorrow? Oh, I didn't. <laughs> then on September 17th, I think that's just a nugget, man, because I'll struggle releasing this word tonight because I'm talking about my own fraternity tonight, man. I'm talking about those that have been called into the pulpit. I'm talking about those in leadership. What brought forth the captivity, man? In Samaria. It started with Jeroboam all the way to Omrah, all the way to Ahab. 900 years later, they're still in a mess. Then on September 17th, during the sixth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, while the leaders of Judah were in my home, the sovereign Lord took hold of me. The prophet is called up. I saw a figure that appeared to be a man from what appeared to be his waist down. He looked like a burning flame. From the waist up, he looked like gleaming amber. He reached out what seemed to be a hand and took me by the hair. Then the spirit lifted me up into the sky and transported me to Jerusalem in a vision from God. I was taken to the north gate of the inner courtyard of the temple where there is a large idol that, had been, has, been, that has made the Lord very jealous. Now stay with me in this. Suddenly the glory of the God of Israel was there just as I had seen it before in the valley. Then the Lord said to me, Son of man, look toward the north. So I looked and there to the north beside the entrance to the gate near the altar stood the idol that made the Lord so jealous. Son of man, he said, do you see what they are doing? Do you see the detestable sins the people of Israel are committing to drive me from my temple? You want to know why it's so dry in the houses of worship? Because when you get so intertwined in this captivity, man. Do you see the detestable sins the people of Israel are committing to drive me from my temple? Why did the glory of God leave Brownsville? Because men's hands begin to touch it. It drove him from the temple. But come and you will see even more detestable sins than these. He's talking about general population, public right there, right? But then he brought me to the door of the temple courtyard where I could see a hole in the wall. Get this. God doesn't pin these things just for a moment of history. These words are alive and well in biblical model even right now. Then he brought me to the door of the temple courtyard where I could see a hole in the wall. He said to me, now son of man, dig into the wall. So I dug into the wall and found a hidden doorway. Go in, he said, and see the wicked and detestable sins they are committing in there. So I went in and saw the walls covered with engravings of all kinds of crawling animals and detestable creatures. I also saw the various idols worshipped by the people of Israel. What does verse 11 say? Seventy leaders of Israel were standing there with Jehoshaphat the son of Shaphan in the center. Each of them held an incense burner from which a cloud of incense rose above their heads. Then the Lord said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the leaders... Let the judgment of God begin where? In the house. He said, have you seen that he brought me in a courtyard? Let's see. Let me, let me get back. But I will show you more successful sins than these. But my goodness. I have, Son of man, have you seen what the leaders of Israel are doing with their idols in what? Finally got there. Where? In dark rooms. What's that representative of? They think they're in secret. Why does the enemy, why does the enemy come and battle me in, in the secret when none of y'all are around? 
And there's been times I've been in the pulpit preaching he'll battle me. Why is it? Because he knows the biblical model in secret. If I begin to give in to what he desires for me to give in to in secret, he knows eventually it will come open to the public. That's a biblical model. He knows it will cause destruction in my life, in my family's life, in the calling of God upon my life. Does anybody understand that? Okay. Have you seen what they're doing with their idols in dark rooms? They are saying, this is, so, this is such the arrogance that is now in the church right now. The Lord doesn't see us. He has deserted our land. Then the Lord added, come and I will show you even more detestable sins than these. He brought me to the north gate of the Lord's temple and some women were sitting there weeping for the God, Tamas. Have you seen this? Yes, but I will show you even more detestable sins than these. Then he brought me into the inner courtyard of the Lord's temple at the entrance to the sanctuary between the entry room and the bronze altar. There were about 25 men with their backs to the sanctuary of the Lord. They were facing east, bowing low to the ground, worshiping the sun. Have you seen this, son of man? He asked, is it nothing to the people of Judah that they commit these detestable sins? Man, I ain't trying to get about works and all this stuff. But you ever been around some folks that, that really hold the banner of Jesus and man, they're involved in stuff that you like, man, there ain't no way I ever be. Man, I got too much of the fear of the Lord to even begin to touch that. You ever been there, man? Yeah. Like how? I, I've been perplexed sometimes as a young believer. I'll say, how is it, God, that you permit and allow them to do that? And if I ever even, the thought comes to my mind, I begin to speak in a heavenly language to get rid of it. It's because they, you know what happens in arrogance? When you become so prideful and so arrogant in the, in the perversion that you're involved in, the fear of the Lord leaves. You lose the fear of the Lord, man. We need a heavy dose of the fear of the Lord in the hearts and lives of people once again. He said, is it nothing to the people of Judah that they commit these detestable sins, leading the whole nation into what? Leading the whole nation into what? Where's our nation right now? Where's our nation right now? Violence in the streets. There's violence on it. Violence in the streets. Leading the whole nation into violence. Thumbing their nose at me and provoking my anger. Therefore, I will respond in fury. He's fixing to respond. There's a window of repentance, but he's fixing to respond. I will neither pity nor spare them. And though they cry for mercy, I will not listen. I'm going to tell you right now, he is fed up. Yep. Amen. You say, Pastor, you, you draw on a strict line that you're going to have to toe after preaching this message. I know that. But it's not me that toes the line, Miss Pam. It's the guider. It's the comforter. It's the one who overcomes in the secret place when every detestable thing would come against me. He's the overcomer. Amen. Amen. I can praise Him now in victory. He said, I will respond. He said, what the leadership? He's speaking specifically. He said, can you believe what they're doing in the dark place? And what's the result? It's leading a nation. It's leading a people into violence. It's leading a people into violence. I'm telling you right now. And I'm closing. I'm telling you right now. And listen to me. If God has brought you to this video and you're in leadership in the church. If you're in a dark room. In a secret place. Involved in detestable things. The hour of repentance is right now. Amen. If you think that you're going to go forth further in this. And it's going to be okay. It doesn't matter. Listen to me. God is fixing to bring your secret right out into the open. Amen. Come on. If that's you in leadership. Listen my God, if, listen to me. We're all of the priesthood of believers and I want to relay that to you if that's you tonight in this place. Your hour of repentance has come. And I'm telling you that it's going to be a short window because He's ready to do this harvest. Amen. Those that will not listen, those that will not listen, He's going to 
blow the cover. Go back with me to John 4, 28, 30. We're, we're finishing. The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village. This is the harvest. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. These people, these people were in the same boat as the woman at the well. They were full of religion, full of man's ways and traditions and culture. But it wasn't working for them either. They were in the same condition. Listen to me. Because of the leadership's failure in the church of America and across the world, there are people, because they think to themselves, they know how to solve supernatural problems without the presence of God. My God, does anybody understand that? They think that, uh, we think we know how to do this. When the presence of God is the only one that can bring healing just like He did to this people right here. Amen. There's so many in captivity. There's such a harvest. Look at John 4, 35-38. Tony, can you play for just a moment? You know the saying. Listen now, this is, this is where it really hits the road for you. And you're going to get an understanding of what God is calling you to now. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike? You know the saying, one plants, another harvests, and it's true. But I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others had already done the work, and now you will get together the harvest. I want you to understand the biblical model of harvest. Now, you know what's fixing to take place. Why did I teach you all that? What's fixing to take place? And I believe it's very prophetic and it will come to pass. It's already beginning to come yet to pass. I'll be honest with you. We've already seen it. There are people in captivity under perverse leadership. In the church. You get that? In the church. They will be the first portion of harvest. How does Jesus harvest when Jesus does it? That is mess with you a little bit, but it's true. It's a biblical model. And even the Apostle Paul carried it. John 4, 35 to 38. You know the saying, four months, or excuse me, go on to the next one, Tracy. This is a biblical model of harvest, Matthew 10. Jesus sent out the 12 apostles with these instructions. Don't go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans. Where did he say go first? Don't go to the Gentiles and Samaritans. Jesus went to the Samaritans himself. He took care of them. He said, but only go to the people of Israel. God's lost sheep. What is that representative of a harvest? What were the children? Of... Man, you've got to understand the Jews and the people of Israel in Jesus' day, they were under captivity of a priesthood that all they cared about was how much money they could get. How much notoriety, how much power they could have as they were in alliance with the Roman government. And if you don't think they were, they were. The very people of God, even in the day of the temple, were sitting in captivity. Jesus runs out the money changers. Jesus begins to set some things straight, man. He began to tell even the leadership of the temple of that day. He said, man, you're full of dead men's bones. You mean you're a ruler in Jerusalem and you don't know these things? Man, you must be born again. There was issue. Amen. There was a people trying to serve the Lord and worship in a captivity even in their own religion. You go back and read the word. Jesus calls it out. Amen. He says, go to the house, the lost sheep of Israel. Go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy, and cast out demons. Give as freely as you have received. When Jesus harvests, what does he do? What are you saying, Pastor? When the Lord penned that paragraph that I keep telling you about five and a half years ago, he said, This call will go to the lost sheep of this region, but it'll also go to the, to the lost sheep. Oh, many of you might even have a copy of that. My mother put it on her refrigerator and she kept it for years. But this call will also go to Miss Pam, the lost sheep of the church. I never would have looked at harvest this way. But I'm going to tell you right now. 
This harvest is going to begin by people leaving the captivity of religious institutions that are only interested in their money. You're fixing to see people come in this place and we've already seen it. We're fixing to see people come and flood in this place to drink from a well that Jesus is sitting by in this place. They're coming out of captivity and they're saying we're done with that religious institution. I'm thirsty, I'm dry, and that's not working for me. The first part of this harvest is coming out of the church. You say, Pastor, our church is going to empty into houses of consecration. I believe that as sure as I'm standing before you right now. The first part of harvest is going to the religious. The first part of harvest of biblical model says go to the Jew first. How do I know that this was a continuation upon his disciples, upon his apostles? Go to Romans 1. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation at work, saving everyone who believes. To what? To the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Even the Apostle Paul who penned this epistle now, who penned this letter to the Romans, he understood that the harvest would even... The Jews were probably the most religious around. But this goes to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. I know this is weird, man. And I never would have thought this way ever because I understood one ministry's law. Our gain from another ministry was another ministry's loss. But it's the biblical model of harvest when he's coming to set things straight in the house. Jesus came and he set things straight in the temple, did he not? And he said, this news, this good news and this kingdom is unto the Jew first. Verse Peter 4. Why did he title this message? He said the title of your message is in Revelation 2. He said because I'm giving a window of time for church leadership to come into repentance. To come into repentance. I'm not saying it's a lost cause. But I'm going to tell you what's done in secret is fixing to come up in the open. And he's fixing to harvest the remnant out of churches. Churches are going to empty all over this region and all over America to houses of consecration. It's coming. Where does he say? And he closes. First Peter 4 17. For the time has come for judgment. Where? And it must begin with God's household. The title of the message is I gave for time. If you're listening by video and you're in leadership tonight, I come to you prophetically announcing that God is giving you a window of repentance. Get it under the blood and get out of that dark room. Get out of that dark room. Ezekiel 8 has uncovered where you are. Get out of there. He's fixing to sweep the house. He's fixing to sweep the house. Those Saturday nights of clicking on pornography and then stepping in the pulpit to preach the word the next day. He's fixing to blow your cover. Get out of that dark room. Get out! Come on. You do not want to hear these words. I gave her time. What did he say in our opening passage of Scripture? Those that are in the bed with Jezebel, man, they will be led into great tribulation. What are we on the heels of? The return of Christ beyond this great harvest. And what's next? Great tribulation. Get out of the dark room. Listen, guys. You need to understand that there are many coming into houses of consecration, and I believe there are more than one, obviously. There's many in the region. But many are coming from the household of the church. They're getting out. They're going to get out. It's the biblical harvest of where we are. God is uncovering these things. I want you to understand this, and I'll let you go. About five, probably about five years ago, six years ago now, we were in the King Center. Shelly, for some reason, I believe this girl was connected to you. There was this blonde-headed girl that came one Sunday morning. What's her name? Allison. I ain't thought about Allison since that day. I was in the secret place. And Allison stopped by the King Center. And I was in the secret place this week, and God took me back to that Sunday. And Allison came one time to one worship service. How old was she then? How old? 20, 25? 20 something. I remember seeing her just 
at the end of that worship service, and I can't remember if it was in the, among the congregation, if it was just before us, and Samantha, I can't remember. But Allison began to prophesy over this call. And she said these very words. She said, this call will be a well of living water that's going to spring up in this region. Amen. And God took me back to that prophetic moment of Allison. And he said, what have you been teaching for the last three weeks if I've been giving it to you? A woman that came to a well. He said, what I prophetically spoke over this call over five years ago, I'm bringing your past in this moment. He said, those full of culture and religion that have been under captivity of perverse leadership, they're coming out to drink. Be the well that I've called you to be. Amen. So when they come, understand this is the biblical model of harvest. To what? To the Jew first. To the religious first. Right? There's a great harvest coming. It's beginning with the church. The remnant coming out. Understand that. That's what's fixing to take place. Don't be surprised when you hear secret dark rooms uncovered. Don't let it startle you in your faith. Don't be like, well, this thing's a joke. Maybe this is why you need to hear this too. But that nobody's real. Listen to me. Remember this night that God said it was coming. Don't let it startle you. Don't let it shake you. Understand that God has called you to be a part of this remnant people that he will build up in this first portion of harvest and what's the second portion of harvest to the gentile to the greek amen to the samaritans come, come, come. Amen. Come on. amen and then we will see the lost sheep of the region stand with me all over this place father i believe i've been obedient tonight in sharing this word Lord, we thank you for teaching. We thank you for spiritual ears that have been given to this people tonight. Lord, now we want to come together and call upon your name on behalf of the leadership of the church. This is how I want to end this service. This is how I want to end this service. I want you to begin to cry out for ministers. I want you to begin to cry out for executive pastors. I want you to begin to cry out for deacons. I want you to begin to cry out for leadership in the church that are standing in dark places right now. Their window has come for repentance. The Bible said there were 70 leaders in that room, man. A multitude of leaders in that dark room that the, that the prophet dug through the wall. We well, as a call right now. We don't want to say because we received this word that we're high and mightier than anybody else. Garbage, man. That could be you. That could be me in that dark room. No. We come with a heart of love and a heart of mercy and a heart of grace. And we say now, Father, Father, I pray in their seat, my God. Seventeen years ago, Father, you came to my secret dark room and you delivered me. Father, I pray that same grace and that same mercy for those in that secret dark room. The year that you rescued me, God, it was the very first year I preached the gospel. You released me fully open to preach the gospel. You can do the same for these leaders right now. Lord, you can release them in the fullness of their calling right now. Father, this is the hour. This is the window. Lord, you say, I gave her time. Lord, this is the moment. Father, I pray now that you would go just so sweetly and so discreetly as you went into my dark room that night and delivered me. Father, would you do so for my brothers? Would you do so for my sisters? Would you do so for those in the leadership of the church? Lord, I ask that with everything that is within me right now. Everything. In Jesus' name. Now, Father, I pray now over us all. Over us all that you would continue to ready us to receive the harvest. Lord, you have revealed that the first portion of harvest is coming from the very brothers and sisters of religion that we have known for some time. 
Lord, I pray now that they would be released from the captivity of, of tradition and religion. Lord, that they would be released from the captivity that's not working for their lives. Lord, that they would be released from the captivity of men's thoughts. That they could come and drink at the wells and the houses of consecration. Lord, there are other houses in this region that you're preparing to receive this harvest. We pray for them now. We pray for those laborers in the field. Lord, we pray for those leaders in the field. Lord, I pray for this house, for these leaders and these laborers right now to receive this harvest. That we might be who we're called to be in this last moment. That the lost sheep of our region would now come as well. We're believing all of this in the name of Jesus. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Father, now lead us from this place in this moment. Keep your hand of protection upon us all. May your provision be for us as you desire. Many blessings and favor upon our lives as you order our steps. We believe that you are well able. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. I believe this is so live in this season right now. And I really struggled with sharing it. I really did. I really did. It was so heavy. I was just texting my brother back and forth. I said, brother, this is so heavy. He gave me a little nugget in the New Living Translation. And this is him speaking. Ezekiel 8, he said, and on September 17th, this is right here. This is right now. I believe this is the Lord. Let this come. And produce in your life and give you an understanding of where you are. God bless you. Love you.